Hi, everyone. Um, I believe we're now live on Facebook. Thanks so much to those of you joining us on Facebook Live today. I'm um, Catherine Orsborn, Executive Director of Shoulder to Shoulder, and I'm so thrilled to have with us today Dr. Ibu Patel. Um, who I think many of you are, are quite familiar with, with him and with his work and with his organization, Interfaith Youth Corps. For those who are not, briefly, Ibu Patel is the, the founder and the president of Interfaith Youth Corps, which is a nonprofit organization working to make interfaith cooperation a social norm in America. He's the author of four books, dozens of articles, and has spoken on more than 150 campuses and served on President Obama's inaugural faith council. He lives in Chicago with his wife, Shanaz, and two young sons, um, and he identifies as a diehard fan of Notre Dame football, Wilco, and really good coffee. Ibu, it's so wonderful to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure. I, Catherine, I have such high regard for you. I have such high regard for the work of Shoulder to Shoulder, so I was very honored to be invited to be a part of this 10-year ten ten -year, uh, celebration of your, of your work. Thank you. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know you have a lot on your plate. Um, so first, just wanted to, to start off by hearing how you're doing, um, how you're faring in, um, in this season of COVID, social distancing, and all the implications that has for, um, for everyone in, in a variety of ways. Yeah, thank you for that. So, so first of all, you know, in, in a, a very heartfelt alhamdulillah, right? Praise be to God. Uh, uh, I'm healthy. My family is healthy. We are deeply fortunate to be um, uh, financially stable um, uh, as an organization and 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 personally as a family. I'm very aware that 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 uh, many people are not. Um, in fact, the majority are not. And so. Um, it's it is a time for pulling together. It's a time for pulling together. Um, and so thank you for asking about me personally. I mean, there's certainly been um, there's certainly been a lot of changes, right? but 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 for me, they're kind of in some ways cosmetic changes. This is my first day back in the office working for six months. It's my kid's first day at school, which is going to be virtual. Uh, so you know we're it's it's a shift in routine as of as of today. Um, uh, and I feel very grateful for not only to, for my personal situation, for, but for the ability to do the work of interfaith cooperation, which is as important as ever, right? And if you just think about, if you think about any American hospital right now, you know, you've got a situation where a Muslim physician is working with a Jewish nurse supported by a Hindu respiratory uh, assistant, a, a, a respiratory uh, therapist, uh, and um, uh, um, a, uh, an atheist social worker in a hospital room that has been sanitized by, uh, by um, a, a Baptist staff member uh, run by an, in, in a secular humanist uh, at a hospital founded by Catholics, right? Like that, that's like every American hospital. That's not, that's not the rare exception. That's every American hospital. The work that we do of interfaith cooperation is both more highlighted than ever and more important than ever. Yeah, great, great point. I mean, thinking about hospitals right now as kind of a microcosm of this country and um, and of how things can can function. <laughs> um, so I want to. This is this is the third in in a conversation series that we're having around, as you noted, the the tenth anniversary of of shoulder to shoulder. Um, and actually the, the anniversary of the founding of Shoulder to Shoulder was yesterday, um, September 7th, 2010. Um, and looking back um, a decade ago, we think about the, um, the controversy around the so-called Ground Zero Mosque, several other very high profile anti-Muslim events, the, the pastor in Florida, for instance, threatening to burn Qurans publicly. Um, there's a mosque in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, right outside of where I now live in Nashville that was, um, that was uh, threatened um, with arson and vandalized numerous times. Um, and so, you know, this was kind of the, the milieu 10 years ago when this, this campaign was founded. And yet here we are in 2020, 10 years later, still fighting blatant anti-Muslim discrimination in, in a variety of ways. So I'm curious to hear your reflections. And actually, I, I think about my own journey in this work and, and how reading um, one of your books um, back in, I think, 
2009, maybe 2010, around around that time, um, was one of the things that really um, inspired me and motivated me to, to be involved in this work. I joined Shoulder to Shoulder in, in 2014, so four years after the founding. And um, and I know that this is this work you've been involved in for more than well over a decade, um, but that that was a catalyst for many people in this country working working on these issues. So I'm curious to hear your reflections, um, kind of looking back over the last 10 years, um, what what has changed since 2010 for for better and for worse? In your life? Well, um, so. Thank you for that question, and I'd be very honored if, if anything that I did facilitated or inspired your your involvement in this, uh, uh, Catherine. Um, so, number one, I think I think it should just be said bluntly: the the anti the overt anti-Muslim sentiment of 2010 did not, while it was a part of mainstream political discourse, mm -hmm. right? It was not a part of mainstream policy making, and here's what I mean by that: yeah. the people who, uh, the politicians who were involved in that anti-Muslim bigotry, Newt Gingrich, Michelle Bachman, that set of people, they they lost quite resoundingly when they ran for president in 2012. Mm -hmm. And the person who wound up winning the Republican nomination for president, Mitt Romney, uh, was very much about um, a sense of religious welcome. As somebody who's from the Latter-day Saints faith, a Mormon himself, he is deeply aware of what it means to be a religious minority. Um, mm -hmm. And and so I actually thought, in fact, I wrote, um, you know, I, I wrote a book that uh, called Sacred Ground, which which starts with the Ground Zero Mosque controversy. And I, I wrote another book recently called Out of Many Fates, in which I, I pointed out that in 2012, it turned out to be a losing strategy to run on anti-Muslim sentiment. Now, that doesn't mean that it didn't get airtime on television, right? And it doesn't mean it didn't whip up ugly crowds of, of, um, of people, you know, doing things like chanting outside of mosques, but it didn't win politically. And then in 2016, it did. Yeah. And just the blatant anti-everybody, anti but white Christians, a certain brand of white Christian that has been a part of the Trump machine, mm -hmm. not just the political rhetoric, but the policy machine has been absolutely stunning. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I felt like I had entered the looking glass and arrived in America in the 1850s when the Know Nothing Party was on the rise. And the Know Nothing Party was a, a, a blatantly nativist, white Protestant party who who said Catholics don't belong. And, you know, sometime in the 1850s, they had like 75 members of Congress, et cetera, et cetera. I felt like I'd entered a, a time portal. That is bad, right? So on the ledger of bad things, having a president who, who having somebody who wins, mm -hmm. who made anti-Muslim rhetoric a central part of his campaign strategy, and made it a part of his policy strategy and appoints people like Steve Bannon and Sebastian, you know, uh, what's his name? So, uh, Sebastian Gorka, I think the name is, uh, uh, Steve Miller. It's, it's just, I am not, I am, I am not, um, I am not a point fingers person, but hate is hate. Hate yeah. is hate. So I want to go on to two more, I think, very positive things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, I think lots of people who are part of this webinar right now know that, for example, Dave Chappelle is a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Now, he's always been Muslim, but he never talked about it before, and people didn't really pay that much attention to it. People know now. Hassan Minhaj didn't exist in 2010. Linda Sarsour was an important activist in local circles, but she wasn't a national slash international figure. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a whole set of of new actors who are part of the, this kind of multicultural, uh, uh, this, this emergence of multicultural America who are prominent Muslims. And I think it's very important to point out that, that they, are, they are not religious, they are not clergy. Yeah. 
They are cultural figures. They're activists. You know, Ramina Shashibi, who's seven miles south of where I, I sit right now, wins, wins the MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, there are civic institutions that emerge, like the Pillars Fund. So there's been a whole, there, you know, the, the uh, Hulu show Rami um, mm -hmm. emerges. Uh, the Wheels of American Arts and Civil Society, Maharshala Ali wins, wins a Golden Globe and an, and an Oscar, right? So there's a whole lot more prominent Muslims who mm -hmm. are engaged in this. And they are not all, they, very few of those people are clergy. And I think part of what that means is that there is a recognition that there is a great diversity within the world of Islam and that uh, um, not everybody's the same. You know, frankly, 10 years ago, I was much more reticent about being old, about talking about the fact that I'm an Ismaili Muslim I'm from a small Shia, often viewed as heterodox community of Islam, right? I've always been proud of being an Ismaili, but I was careful about talking about it. I'm like very open about that now right? Islam is a diverse religion, like deal with the diversity, everybody. Yeah. Deal with the diversity, right? And by the way, Maharshala Ali is an Ahmadi Muslim. Would you really, he still not have, won, would you, would you rather he not have won an Oscar? Right. Right. <laughs> like deal with the diversity, right? Like the most prominent Muslims in American history were black Muslims. Yeah. Deal with the diversity, right? America has to deal with its diversity, which includes Muslims. Muslims have to deal with its diver their diversity, which includes Ismailis and Sufis and gay Muslims and, and uh, Salafi Muslims. It's all part of the diversity. Yeah. And the final thing that I'll say is that there's a, there's a lot more efforts like yours, Catherine, like shoulder to shoulder, a lot more efforts, right? There's a ton of local efforts. There's a ton of campus efforts. There are a handful of national efforts like the one that you lead. And, and there are a whole bunch of people saying that America is not a melting pot. We are a potluck supper that is, and, and the nation only feasts when we welcome the contributions of all communities. Yeah, thanks for that. That has been, um, that, that last point has been such a um, encouragement in, in my work um, in this space over the last several years, just seeing, how many people um, want to be engaged in this work? How many people of, of, that are not of Muslim background want to be engaged in the work of, of being good allies in um, fighting anti-Muslim bias and discrimination? Like we have way more um, people wanting to come to our, our trainings or bring trainings to their communities than we're able to, to keep up with. And I think that's such an encouragement to see how many people are doing such um, important um, and really well well thought through I think local work on this on this issue um, but on on inclusion more broadly as well um, so one of the things that you talk a lot about and it is in the sort of tagline for um, interfaith youth Corps the organization that you founded is this idea of making interfaith cooperation a social norm so I'd like to ask you to talk about that a little bit to unpack what you mean by um, making interfaith cooperation a social norm Right. Well, you know, I, um, if you were to ask a hundred people on the street what environmentalism was, they would they would have a set of images and mm -hmm. definitions and descriptions that would all basically fit in a, a single category that associated with recycling and climate change and clean water and they would know the actions they did to that effect, right? So environmentalism has become a social norm. That doesn't mean that it is always enacted, but, but there is a general image that it, uh, that it evokes in the yeah. population. Um, human rights is another good example of that, right? Mm -hmm. There was a time not that long ago when, uh, when human rights was not a, wasn't, you know, if you, if you were to tap somebody in the shoulder a hundred years ago and say human rights, they would give you a blank stare. So imagine doing that experiment when it comes to interfaith cooperation. Imagine walking out into the street, wherever you are, tapping 100 people on the shoulder and saying interfaith cooperation. And what are the things that come to mind for those people, right? And my wild guess is a significant amount of them just give you a blank stare. Uh, another set might say something like, well, that's when the Pope and the Dalai Lama shake hands, right? Another set might say, well, that's, you know, that's against my religion. So part of what our movement has to do is to mobilize um, 
easily accessible common symbols of interfaith cooperation. I personally think the single best one is, is, uh, is, is a hospital floor mm -hmm. where, where people, where healthcare practitioners and patients and family members from a range of different faiths are engaged in a positive collective endeavor healing. And all of them are inspired in some way or another by their different religions, but they're there doing something in common, right? It is our job. That's a good example of making interfaith cooperation a social norm. So I'll tell you when this happened uh, previously in American history. It's the story of, uh, of the phrase Judeo-Christian. When I speak on college campuses, I often use the joke, you know, when the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, they they etched off the stone and they saw the words Judeo-Christian nation etched in that rock. And, you know, these like really, really smart 19 year olds with test scores uh, uh, through the roof will kind of give me this look like, I know that's not true, but I don't actually know where the word actually comes from, right? So Judeo-Christian, as you can imagine, it wasn't etched in the stone of Plymouth Rock. It wasn't written in the Declaration of Independence. It wasn't carved, you know, uh, um, uh, in the American Midwest when the pioneers moved west. Judeo-Christian uh, was an invention of really the 1930s and 1940s. It was, it was made up. Yeah. Judeo-Christian uh, is not hundreds of years old, right? It's not theologically accurate. <clears throat> it's not historically especially accurate. It was made up by a very important interfaith organization that was founded in the late 1920s as a response to the anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism mm -hmm. of the 1920s organization called the National Conference for Christians and Jews, uh, NCCJ, and they ran a whole bunch of programs like you run programs. They ran uh, what they called uh, tri-faith dialogues, a priest, a minister, a rabbi would go to cities across the country and do a talk, and then they would help the local clergy from that area run their own ongoing program. When, when World War II emerges, they visited 778 military installations across the country, et cetera, et cetera. And amongst the most powerful things that NCCJ does is they invent the word Judeo-Christian. And it was a response to... Um, to uh, America deeply believing itself to be a Protestant nation. And, and if you want like a, a good touchstone for just how deeply America viewed itself as a Protestant nation, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, the great liberal lion of the Great Depression and World War II, he said, this is a Protestant country and Catholics and Jews are here under sufferance, mm -hmm. right? That's how deeply the Protestant nation identity was kind of uh, uh, in America's DNA. And, the NCCJ shifts that. And, and one of the ways to, to kind of uh, get a sense of, of just how deep that shift was is, is we don't question the origins of the term. We just, we, we just assume it's been around forever when in fact it was an interfaith organization that, that created it. Now, of course, everybody criticizes the term Judeo-Christian now. It's not expansive enough. It's not inclusive enough, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, think for a second, would you rather be a Jew in America in 1930 or 1980, right? Or a Catholic in 1930 or 1980? And the fact is Judeo-Christian did good work. And the other fact is that we need a new phrase, yeah. right? Um, uh, we are a nation where there are you know, almost as many Muslims and Buddhists as there are uh, Methodists and Jews. Yeah. It's time for a new phrase. And so at IFYC, we talk about being interfaith America. We talk about being a potluck nation and not a melting pot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that a interfaith cooperation becoming a social norm is, is everything from kind of uh, um, easy visuals that people have available to them in their minds, like, like doctors and nurses from different religious backgrounds serving, uh, serving patients who are also from different religious backgrounds, and phrases like interfaith America that help us uh, uh, understand our country in more expansive ways. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for unpacking that. Um, and I'm gonna quote you <laughs> for, for a second. Um, you have said diversity is not just about the differences you like. So when we're thinking about this um, normalizing interfaith cooperation, making it a social norm, 
how, what do, what do you think it looks like? Um, and, and maybe you could give some examples of um, meaningful, authentic interfaith engagement across lines of deep disagreement. Um, where have you seen that done well? Uh, so, you know, I've seen it done. So, um, first of all, I think that this is definitional to interfaith cooperation, right? So, so on matters of theology, and let me rephrase that, on matters of doctrine, whether Jesus is the son of God or whether he is the prophet of God or whether he's a good rabbi, mm -hmm. there's not going to be agreement. Different religions, ex different religions are different for very obvious reasons, right? And frankly, on a set of matters of justice, um, uh, on abortion, for example, there is unlikely to be agreement. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, do we allow the things that we disagree on to cancel any possibility of relationship? Mm -hmm. Now, my answer to that is, in some cases, maybe. Right, like I am not buying a brownie from a KKK bake sale, uh, uh, even if the KKK folks say that they are Christian, and if the proceeds of the bake sale go to the local preschool, mm -hmm. right? I'm probably not buying a brownie. But most other people I'm talking with, and I'm actually trying to find common ground with, right? Because how do you have a diverse democracy unless people who disagree on some fundamental things are willing to work on other fundamental things. I'm gonna say that again, because it's like my best line in 10 years. You know, How do you have a diverse democracy if people who are willing to disagree on some fundamental things are unwilling to work together on other fundamental things? And I think everybody has their, everybody has their line. Everybody has their line. And you know, my line is probably, like I said, I'm not buying, I'm not buying, um, I'm not buying a bunny from a KKK bake sale, but frankly, I've worked with all kinds of people who aren't really sure if Ismailis are legitimate Muslims, and I'm super happy to find common ground with them. Although, you know, it's kind of insulting to me that 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 they question my legitimacy in that ways. I still think that that the project of of common ground and bridges is 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 more important than than fronting that disagreement. I also think the project of common ground and bridges allows for a different kind of conversation about disagreements, mm -hmm. right? It, it is, you know, um, it is much better to have a conversation about any range of doctrinal or justice oriented, uh, et cetera, et cetera, conflicts if you have if you have uh, engaged in a project that you both believe is a part of your religion, like in other words, you are commanded by your faith to serve the hungry and the homeless, you are commanded by your faith to be a healer in a hospital, you are commanded by your faith to be involved in a movement like um, uh, a movement against sexual exploitation, for example, right? And then you and then you say, you know, so can we let, let's talk about this uh, this um, uh, uh, prophet Isa thing, you know, like uh, what, what? Tell me about how you don't understand the importance of having a savior. You know, I I'd much rather do that after after a positive engagement. Yeah. Um, but I just, you know, I think I think that that disagreements between religious communities is just definitional to interfaith cooperation. That doesn't mean that coalitions of liberal Protestants and reformed Jews and progressive Muslims and secular humanists aren't important. That is really important, right? That's really important. But I, I kind of think of that more as like building a, a political coalition mm. with, the, with the human capital of diverse religious communities. Super important. Right, um, I think of interfaith work as as the recognition of deep difference and the building of civic bridges, um, uh, the ability to bracket those differences in order to build civic bridges and to, in the best case scenario, circle back later. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, thanks for that. Um, and thinking about. Um, like the last several several months in particular, um, 
and the justice issues that have really come to the surface in, in kind of American public conversation. So um, I'm thinking particularly around um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, racial justice issues that have, have clearly been, been present in the United States for a very long time, but have, have really become much, um, a much deeper part of the um, uh, kind of uh, public conversation in many ways over the last few months. And I want to hear um, your perspective on thinking about justice issues that naturally intersect with, um, and, and we can make a case that all justice issues um, at some point naturally intersect with, with thinking about issues of, of interfaith cooperation and interfaith, interfaith engagement and relationship building. Um, but how do you think about approaching justice issues that intersect in with the interfaith space? And, and with that question, I also want to invite you um, to, to kind of help us look ahead. <laughs> um, we, we started this at, at the very beginning of this conversation, kind of looking back. Um, and, and I'd like to invite you in, in responding to this question to also um, help us to look forward together towards the next decade and beyond um, on what we need and where we need to be going to, to be where you, where you imagine um, us being, if, if you could name that vision for, for America in the next 10 years. And I know you have some, um, some, some slides that I'll pull up on the screen while you, while you start to yeah. respond there. So I've got, a, I've got a, a maybe a 12 or 15 minute slideshow on these two questions that ends, ends with the video. So let's, let's do these slides and I'll, I'll address both the racial justice questions and the kind of where do we go from here question. So, you know, on this, on the next slide here, what I've got here is uh, to begin with is kind of a series of photos if we just want to advance about um, the centrality of interfaith cooperation to racial justice. Let me go back one, uh, um, uh, Catherine. So the, back. Um, so this of course is the famous uh, march uh, from Selma to Montgomery and there's Dr. King right in the, in the center. Um, and you know, Somebody once pointed out to me, we talk a lot about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., not enough about Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. and, and when we put it that way, it's kind of obvious, you recognize uh, just how deep his Christian faith was to him, right? And also how much he partnered with people from other religions. And you know, here you have the person looking at you through those glasses and that bushy beard is the Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, um, who said that the soul of Judaism was at stake in the civil rights movement. There are Catholic sisters who are um, here in this march. There's Unitarian Universalist James Reeb who gets murdered by white supremacists in Selma. Malcolm X uh, speaks at Brown Chapel a few days before this march. And so the, the Selma for Montgomery March is, a, is an interfaith movement. In fact, all of the civil rights movement is an interfaith movement. King gets his principal inspiration, of course, from Jesus, but he says second to Jesus, it's Gandhi, right? And, and he actually visits India because he wants to uh, learn more about Gandhi Satyagraha movement. The point that I want to make is that, that the racial justice movement that we call civil rights in the United States was an interfaith movement. And this plays a huge role in me starting IFYC in the late 1990s was I was first a racial justice activist and it was when I became more and more aware of the interfaith dimension of several of several racial justice movements that I thought to myself, what does it look like to do that in this era? We go to the next slide. Um, uh, it's a series of images of Mandela with people from different religious traditions and, and seeing Mandela speak in 1999 and him saying that the struggle against apartheid was a movement of Christians and Muslims and Jews and African traditionalists and Buddhists and Hindus and Baha'is and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, was, that was major for me, right? So, you know, here's maybe the greatest figure of the entire 20th century saying that the reason that he is free mm -hmm. and that South Africa is liberated is because of an interfaith mm -hmm. movement. And Mandela's engagement with people from different faiths is really robust and powerful, right? So you know, civil rights, in the United States is an interfaith movement. The struggle in South Africa is an interfaith movement. If we go to the next slide, Catherine, um, here's Gandhi and Bacha Khan and Jawaharlal Nehru. Hind Swaraj in India is an interfaith movement. Bacha Khan is, is a, 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 an, a, a Muslim from Afghanistan, part of, part of the Pashtun tribe. Jawaharlal Nehru is very famously a secular humanist, right? And 
and Mahatma Gandhi is, you know, a, amongst the kind of uh, exemplars of Hinduism of the 20th century. And so as a young person in my 20s, I'm like looking at all of these movements, which I consider principally anti-colonial and racial justice movements. And I'm like recognizing these interfaith dynamics and recognizing that when, when a lot of the, 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 the founders of these, the, when, when a lot of the people who led these movements started, they were young. So Gandhi was in his early 20s, right? King was 26. The Dalai Lama was barely out of his teens. Um, all of that was really powerful for me. And if we go to the next slide, somebody who in this picture is not young, uh, but that's Dorothy Day, you know, uh, um, uh, approaching, approaching 80 and staring down police officers in, in one of her probably thousands and thousands of protests. She's the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, and it was the Catholic Worker Movement and Dorothy Day's example, uh, learning about it when I was maybe 20 years old, that, that first inspired me about religion and, and the role of religion in social action. And, and, and that was my portal, of course, to interfaith cooperation. And so I see, I see interfaith cooperation at the heart of racial justice as being, at least for me, uh, um, a hand in glove type situation, right? A hand in glove type situation. So this moment that, 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 we, that we are in, in the aftermath of the brutal murder of George Floyd and just the continuing, uh, just stark um, uh, marginalization and oppression and misrepresentation of, of, of principally black people, uh, and also other people of color, this is, this is a time for us to feel commanded by our faiths to come together in something positive, right? And, and we, have this, we have this wind at our back, what Cornell West calls a wind at your back when you're doing, when you're doing th this kind of, of, of work and realizing that there are people who have gone before who have done it before you. And you can call kind of on that echo to inspire you. Um, so I wanted to just show those those slides, and you know you're welcome to share this with anybody who's on this on this uh, uh, webinar today, and, and hopefully they will inspire you and 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 inspire you to think about what what this kind of work looks like in the here and now. Um, moving on from that, I want to I want to just highlight some of the powerful statistics from our our uh, IFYC's just major recent survey called Ideals, which is the most ambitious survey uh, ever done of religious diversity and divides in higher education. Um, uh, and I, I, I highlight this in response to the question, where do we go from here? Because I think an excellent, an excellent way to respond to that is, is where, where are young people at? Where are college students at? So if you go to the next slide here, Catherine. Um, um, so here, here were the research questions at the, at the heart of, of ideals. Um, What's the interfaith potential of this generation of college students? Um, how do students' interfaith attitudes and behaviors change during college? How do college students perceive and experience religious and spiritual diversity on campus? And what campus experiences and educational practices foster behaviors and attitudes that are essential for interfaith cooperation, right? So these are some of the guiding research questions. I mean, it is, you know, it is a long and complex survey, but those are, those are kind of some of the, the anchors. Um, Go to the next slide. Uh, just a, a little bit of the recent this. The whole slide's not coming up here for some reason, but but this just shows that there were uh, um, we had a, 120 campuses with 20,000 respondents to begin. It was a longitudinal survey. Uh, the second administration was over 7,000 respondents, and the third was about 3,500 respondents. And that's all. That's all kind of statistically significant. And so what you're getting here is findings from a very, very robust data set. Um, move on here. Uh, and there was some qualitative work done there. So I think the first thing to know is that 70% of students said that it was important to, in, to bridge religious divides. Right? So we have a generation of college students who see the importance of interfaith cooperation. The, the smaller numbers that you see there are are the uh, just highlight that that most religious groups the percentage of students saying this was important grew and amongst Muslims and and Mormons it grew the most so so um, you know seventy three percent of Muslims came in believing that that bridging religious divides were important and by the end of college eighty eight percent thought that was important right 
69% of Mormons coming in thought bridging religious divides were important. And, and by the end of college, 82% believe that, right? So a huge majority of students believes that bridging religious divides is important. That is very good news. Okay, next slide. Here's the not so good news. How many of them actually engaged with a formal interfaith activity when they were in college? Not as many as, as say that it was important to engage in, it, it was very important to bridge religious divides. So 38%, uh, which is a, not, a, not a terrible number, uh, attended a religious service for a religious tradition other than their own. Um, you know, they probably went with a friend to Juma prayers or to uh, uh, Shabbat services or to, or to mass, something along those lines. Um, only 26% in, were in a religion course that, uh, that addressed knowledge of a different religious tradition, mm -hmm. right? That, I don't think that's a great number. And, and, and far fewer engaged in, um, in a direct interfaith activity. So I think that's powerful to realize, like 70% of students say that it's important to bridge religious divides far fewer actually engage in an activity. Now, I work in higher ed. I know that students will say something is important and then you'll say, great, there's a program on that that night and they won't come, right? This is not, a, this is not blaming the wonderful people in higher ed that run interfaith work. This is saying that, that let's think creatively about how to close this gap, right? Students know that this is important. By the way, if you had asked students in 1998, is participate is bridging religious divides important? I would be shocked if over 50% said it was important. I think it's really the kind of ugliness of the last 20 years that make people think to themselves, this is important work to do. Are there ways that we can make interfaith activities more as attractive as possible, perhaps even required as a part of something like first year orientation? Mm -hmm to close the gap between students who say it's important and students who participate in one. Yeah. Next slide. So here's some really good news. You know, one of the things that college does is it brings people of different identities together and almost 100% of college students, um, uh, almost 100% of college students say that they have a friend from a different religion. I think that's a really powerful thing, right? Uh, they met through intramurals, they met in class, they met in the residence halls, uh, uh, they met just hanging out. It's a powerful thing. Next slide. Um, this for me is a, a hugely powerful set of data points, okay? So look at, the, look at the little caption on top there. The percentage of students who said that they somewhat or strongly agreed that they dedicated time to learn about the following groups in college. 74% of students said that they spent time in class or in a student affairs workshop, focused time learning about people from a different race or ethnicity. 73% mm -hmm. said that they learned about people from a different country. That means that the college thinks this is important, right? The college is saying, you have to take a class in this. We're going we're gonna to program around this. We're going you know, to highlight this in RA training or in first year orientation. It's important to learn about politically liberal people. It's important to learn about politically conservative people. It's important to learn about gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. That is all important. Over 50% of college students, well over 50% say that it, as a part of their curriculum, they focused time on people from different races, different sexualities, different countries, different, uh, different politics. When it gets to religion, no group cracks the 50% mark. Mm. Fewer than 50% of college students say that they spent any time focused on any religious group. That is a, that is a, that should shock us, yeah. right? Higher education, which is a, uh, is a place that launches our next generation of leaders, which defines what it means to be an educated person, spends far less time focused on matters of religious diversity than on matters of race and sexuality and ethnicity and national origin. By the way, I want all of these numbers to go up, right? But the, the, the part of this in orange, right? The part about religious groups, that should be a large, the most religiously diverse nation in human history. 
the most religiously devout country in the Western Hemisphere uh, at a time when, you know, uh, um, there is profound discrimination against people from different religions and there is a deep divide uh, um, uh, between people from different faiths, colleges are not focusing on this. That is a problem. Yeah. Next slide. And, you know, part of what Shoulder to Shoulder and IFYC is about is addressing that, is giving faith communities and religious leaders and colleges the ability to engage in these, uh, in these issues, it, uh, um, it, to talk about religious diversity, to, to, in, to bridge the religious divide. And so IFYC has just launched this campaign called We Are Each Others that's headlined by this awesome two minute video. And I'll just kind of close this, this presentation by, by playing this. And by the way, if you Google We Are Each Others and IFYC, you'll come up with the educational module we did. And maybe Catherine, you and TC can share, uh, share the link. I'll, I'll email it to you right now. Maybe you can share it with the folks on this webinar. But let's watch this awesome video and turn the volume up because the um, voiceover is great also. Great, give me one second because I think I need to toggle between a couple shares, one sec. <laughs> We come from all over the world, carrying our history, our legacies, our stories, our ancestors and practices we've maintained for generations or created ourselves. We are orthodox and secular. We are searching and spiritual. We are black and brown and white and everything in between. We are civically minded. And when we look at what's happening in society, we think maybe we can help. We have faith in our communities, our families, ourselves, and we are inspired by our traditions to imagine an America that is different, an America that is more kind and compassionate and just. We know we can create one, especially when we come together, when we call on our crew, when we gather to work, when the many assemble as one for the betterment of all. Like those who have inspired us, they came from somewhere. They were young people, bridge builders whose visions and traditions compelled them to act. They were brave and outrageous. They did things that had not been done. They led acts of service across lines of difference. Today, interfaith leaders in communities, campuses, and in the streets across the country are engaging in conversations and actions that steer broad cultural change. And it starts with you and your story and your story in conversation with others like you and not like you, a growing understanding of our difference and similarities that broaden our sense of who we are and who we are in connection to others, and what it means to renew the broken promises of our country. Become a bridge builder. America needs you. As Miss Brooks said, we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. So, um, I, by the way, I now know how much work and money goes into two minutes of excellent video. So <laughs> um, we're very proud of that. And by the way, we are offering a mini grant that, that is a part of an educational module. Again, if you just Google, we are each other's and IFYC, you'll come up with that educational module. You'll also see if you scroll down that there are, um, we are offering mini grants to people who want to teach that module in their, in their religious community. So we've got funding to do that. And so we'd love to partner with, uh, with you at Shoulder to Shoulder on getting, on getting, that, mo uh, getting that module out there and on um, giving some mini grants to help you and your crew do that. Yeah. Great, that's, yeah, so beautiful. I love the, the vision cast in that video. It's so energizing. Um, and and just so appreciate um, hearing the the what you shared from the ideal survey. Just seeing where young people are in this um, has has been one of the things that that keeps I think spurring all of us on in this work. Um, seeing what that looks like. So I wanna um, 
uh, we have a few more minutes together and I want to um, go to a couple of the questions that have come up from, from the Facebook Live. Um, so we have one question from um, Catherine Laurie, who is with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Um, she says, in a time when religious leadership is not in the center of the public square, how do you see this playing out in today's Black Lives Matter and other justice movements? Right, so nice, nice to engage with Catherine and Nancy. I, I probably, uh, you know, lots of people on this on this Zoom. I imagine uh, um, I we've been friends for years, and so hello, hello to all of you, and hello to folks that I've not met but are going to be friends in the future. I mean, I, you know, I uh, I am always I'm always struck by that religion shows up in lots of different ways. Spirituality shows up in lots of different ways. And, and it's not always people with the collar, right? And so if you go to a hospital and you ask people what inspired them to become a healer, lots of it is religious stories, even though they're not wearing a collar uh, uh, in the operating room, right? It, it, is, it is their work as a doctor or a nurse that's the, the expression of their faith. And so, and so I know that that's the case in the Black Lives Matter movement. I know that that's the case in lots of the civic and social justice movements right now, is, is it is people enacting uh, uh, faith within the categories of, of Sikhism or Hinduism or Islam or Judaism or Christianity, and also enacting their spirituality in other ways. And I just think we need to, paying attention to that in the ways that it is manifesting, I think is powerful, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not in the same way of like, it's not necessarily as, as cut and dried as Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, but it is there. Yeah. Yeah. So in some ways kind of decentering the um, institutional or maybe clerical leadership in, in religious movements and, and paying attention to um, where it is, is throughout. Um, you know, we, we, you know, it, it's, it's um, uh, I mean, Bayard Rustin, for example, didn't wear a collar, yeah. but he was a Quaker. Right. And, right. and he's, he's the, 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 one of the figures in the video you just saw, uh, he's the gentleman with his, his hand pointing up to the sky. He's a gay Quaker and him be, his Quakerness is absolutely at the core of his commitment to nonviolence. Right. That's the case with so many people now. Right. So it's, so, so, um, collars are welcome. Kippas are welcome. Of course, you know, of course, and there's other people in the mix also, many of them connected to quote unquote traditional religions, virtually all of them connected to some sort of spirituality and let's listen to what they're telling us. By the way, I, I say that to myself also, like I have no greater wisdom on this than, any, than anybody else, you know? Yeah, that's good. Um, so Rabbi Nancy Kramer asks, um, your discussion of Judeo-Christian becoming a thing um, made her wonder about the phrase Abrahamic and what you think of that, that phrase. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. Nice, nice to engage with you. So, you know, I've, I, I'm not, I, I prefer the word interfaith to Abrahamic or, or you know, I, pre, I prefer, there are too many Buddhists and Sikhs and Hindus and Taoists, and et cetera, et cetera in the United States, let alone the world, for us to use language which, which does not include folks, right? For me, the word interfaith, as has always been the case at IFYC, proactively includes atheists and secular humanists. Mm -hmm. um, it just notes that, that conversations about our orientations around religion, which includes, by the way, atheism and secular humanism is going to be a part of the mix, right? So I just think that we should uh, the, the the goal here is not to take one step forward from from Judeo Christian to include Muslims and to leave out Hindus and Buddhists, et cetera. The goal is to say, is there a canopy which can make sure that 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 discussions about religion remain at the at the heart, which includes people from a range of identities and backgrounds? Yeah, thanks for that. And I think um, we'll, we'll close um, with this question from Kay Ann Albright. She asks, what do you think is the best way to draw people into current movements? And I kind of want to tack on to that as uh, in kind of closing this, you know, if you were to, to give folks listening one or two sort of next 
things they should be doing, paying attention to, seeking out? What, a, what does that look like for you for, for people to leave this and to, to move forward in this space? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that those images that I had at the beginning of the slideshow, they're very powerful, at least for me, because they show that interfaith cooperation has this glorious history, right? That, um, and, and it shows that interfaith cooperation has changed the world. Mm -hmm. Interfaith cooperation uh, helped bring down Jim Crow in the United States. It helped bring down apartheid in South Africa. It helped liberate India, right, from British colonial rule. Um, interfaith cooperation has had a glorious history, and it and it raises the question: What about us? What are we going to do, right? And which is where the "We Are Each Other"s video comes in. Um, mm -hmm. What what are we going to do? What is going to be? What role will our interfaith leadership play in this moment in history. So, yeah. so I think that, that that's, that's really powerful. I think a second thing that's powerful is it is the job of interfaith leaders to create activities that people find compelling, mm -hmm. right? And so I think the gap between the 70% of college students who say that they know bridging divides is important and the 14% who actually engages in interfaith activity is, is, how to, is creating a compelling activity. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy to do. I'm just saying it's incumbent upon us to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. Um, and I think that, that it, it involves our, our creativity around um, thinking outside the box <laughs> on that. And, and especially right now during COVID, um, and I, but, but I have seen so many creative ways of drawing people even into virtual engagement um, while we've been in this season of social distancing to know that it's, it's completely possible to, to continue to reimagine and rethink um, what, it, what it looks like to create um, things that people want to be part of, that people want to show up at college students and, and beyond that as well. Um, so thanks. Right. And our, you know, our little contribution to that right now, our little experiment is, is let's see if people can take this We Are Each Other's module and spread it through their faith communities and spread it through their organization. And we're, we're willing to put some money behind it. So there are yeah. many grants available for people who commit to doing that. If you, if you check out our website and the We Are Each Other's campaign. Yeah, awesome. And we'll share that on our, our Facebook page where folks are joining the live and we'll make sure to share that in this in the feed um, below the live video as well so that you have those resources. Um, so Ibu, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for taking this time um, today, but also for um, the, the huge um, thought leadership and, and active <laughs> doing um, leadership that you have been um, helping so many of us um, trying to navigate these spaces um, to think through how to do it well. Um, I'm really, really grateful to you. And I know there are so many others um, that we're joining today who have um, have been impacted by the, the work you have been leading over the past many years and just grateful to you for taking the time today. It's very kind of you. Thank you to you, Catherine. Congratulations on your work. Congratulations on the 10th anniversary. And thanks to everybody who's on this call uh, and thank you for your interfaith leadership and the work you're doing to build interfaith America. Thank you. Take care. Bye everybody.